Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Welcome to this study of Luke chapter 24 for the third Sunday of Easter. Uh, two texts really before us, and one of them you will see is an overlap for the text that we use for the Ascension Day. I, I think the lectionary committee, when it chose this text for this day, uh, recognized that not that many people preach on Ascension Day, so that there is the natural overlap between the two. But let's get started right away but to talk about the two different parts of this text. First of all, I think we can divide the text into verses 36 to um, 40, 43, excuse me, I couldn't see it. Uh, 36 to 43, so it's right here, is the break. And then 44 to 49. And of course, it is this text here that is the overlap with Ascension, because the Ascension text is 50 to 53. Let's see if you can see that there, 50 to 53. So, in many ways, I think you have a choice. You could preach on just the first part of the text, or you could preach on the second part. Um, maybe the thing to do is to preach on this part, and if you are preaching on Ascension, to save this part for the second uh, preaching of this in, in the later part of the Easter season on Ascension Day. But anyway, that's sort of our choice. One of the other things that I'd just like to point out here is that there are a series of texts, of course, in Luke 24 that need to be understood as going together in many ways. And there's a very interesting thing that happens um, at the end of the Emmaus story, which is this passage right here. This is, of course, the resurrection account to the women. But at the end of the Emmaus story, when the disciples return to Jerusalem, after the breaking of the bread, the evangelist says that, that, that they are there in this hour, you know, and the eleven are gathered there, and, you know, they say the Lord is risen indeed and appeared to Peter. And then, of course, the Emmaus disciples give an account, an exegesis of the things on the road and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Here's what's interesting, is that immediately following this text here, there are no more time references. So, in other words, through the rest of the rest of the gospel, really, the rest of this chapter, there's no more time references. And some of the higher critics have kind of commented on this and said that these three texts here, and I think it's important to see them here, these three texts here at the end, that these texts all took place on Easter Day, that Jesus even ascended on Easter Day, because Luke, who is so careful in his time references to this point, all of a sudden drops them here. And so they say, oh, Luke is confused, and he finally kind of gets it together at the end where, you know, in Acts, where he realizes that there was 40 days for the ascension after, and then, of course, Pentecost. But I think the point is, and you can see it here, after he said these things, what things? The things that went before, of course. It appears, as he stands there in the midst of them and says, peace to you, we, we sort of saw this, um, a, a couple of weeks ago in, in John 20, that they, these seem to be almost the same passage. Is this taking place on the, on the first day of the week that is Easter? I, I don't know that we know that. We just, it's hard to say. Uh, and maybe this one does. And then this one takes place afterwards. But the point is, is that once bread is broken here and eyes are opened, there is no more need for time references because we are, to use my favorite phrase, we're in the eighth day. We're in the eternal day. The Eucharist brings in the eighth day, and we now live in this, this time without time, that where eternity has broken in. The, the, the infinite is now in the finite time, and we are living in this, this end time reality. It's really quite remarkable if you think about it. Now, let's get to the text. There are so many incredibly important themes here that I want to make sure that, that we highlight them very, very carefully. Um, I've got some of them here in colored, so you can see what they are. First of all, the, this is perhaps the great theme of Luke. 
Um, and, and I think you could argue that it's either joy and or peace or both. Um, I've always commented when I teach the liturgy that this is the number one word of the liturgy. That's why you come to the liturgy to have peace. And this greeting, peace to you, goes back to Luke chapter 10 when Jesus sent the 70. And he sends them like he sent the 12. But he tells them here very specifically, don't give the greeting that is normally given on the road. But when you enter into a house, and this is obviously a house where they will bring the gospel, you say peace to that house. That's the new greeting of the kingdom. And you preach the kingdom of God and you heal. Well, the first thing Jesus does when he stands in the midst of them, and that's a very important little phrase there. Let me, let me show that, ho highlight how that is. Um, that this phrase right here, in the midst of, that is so crucial that he is there present for them. I mean, that's, that's the way that word is understood. And when he gives this greeting, he is now simply carrying out what he instructed them to do in Luke 10, as I said before. So, first of all, that's a very, very important, uh, a very important theme here. Secondly, we have this incredibly important theme of the Spirit. But it's, it's not the, the Spirit as, you know, the Holy Spirit. But they think they're seeing, and I think this is how some of the translations do it, they think they're seeing a ghost. They don't know what they're seeing. And in many ways, the whole point of this section here, where, you know, see my hands and my feet, you know, um, that he has flesh and bones, you know, ostia, bones, that, 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 that this is a body, and it is a risen body. And in, a, in many ways, this text is simply to testify to the reality of Christ's resurrected body. Now, perhaps the most important part of this entire text, however, comes here in what Jesus says, ego eimi, and then autos. Some of you who know this from the Emmaus story, this is the word that Jesus uses of himself in Emmaus. So this is, this is a very important kind of technical word in Luke. I am he. I am. He is the great I am. And there, this body is the title of Yahweh himself. And Jesus is testifying here as he shows his hands and his feet that he is flesh and bone, and a spirit does not have that. So the idea that Jesus here, right after giving the greeting of peace, that what he's doing here is he is testifying to the fact that his body has risen from the dead. I cannot en uh, emphasize that enough. And, and we must remember how important it is that in the Apostles' Creed, we confess the resurrection of the body. Here it is. One of my other very favorite expressions here that <clears throat> I think is just stunning in its, uh, let me try this color, uh, in, its, in its statement here is um, when he shows them, and again, notice hands and feet. This, is, this, is, uh, this was the theme of the sermon. I looked up uh, the, the sermon I'd written on this uh, before presenting this. They disbelieve from joy. Now, what does that mean? they disbelieve for joy. Well, I think one commentator had it best. And he said, this is the equivalent of saying, this is too good to be true. And I think that's exactly what it means. Too good to be true. But you know, all the Gospels have this in some way. Matthew says that they, they had joy and fear, that combination of the two. Um, John, as you remember a couple of weeks ago with Thomas, you know, unbelief and belief at the same time. I mean, in a sense, this is what this is. They disbelieve for joy. It was too good to be true. I mean, and this is what the resurrection does. It defies reality. It is too good to be true. Could it be that, in fact, what he said is the case? And then this wonderful moment here where you can see 
um, at, at the, uh, the statement after they, they disbelieve for joy. Um, as my, as my, my kids would say, Jesus says something which is completely, at least in some ways, totally random. I mean, here you have this remarkable scene where he says peace, he says that I'm the I am, he shows you know, his body and, and, and you know, affirms that he is, 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 is the risen body, they disbelieve for joy. And then totally random, he goes, hey, you got anything to eat around here? Does anybody have anything? You know, it's like, he's like a, a teenager coming into the house and opening the refrigerator and saying, hey, you got anything to eat? And I love the, the, the specificity of this, that they gave him a piece of, of roasted fish. You know, it was a piece of roasted fish. And I think there's something there. The, the, the breakfast on the beach with John was roasted fish. The, the Passover is roasted. You know, th this is sort of a, a, there's a connection there in some way. And he took it and he ate it before them to obviously show that he is not a spirit, but he is flesh and bones, that, that he is a body, you know, that has hands and feet, of course, with the wounds. But it's, it's a marvelous example of how Jesus testifies here by eating roasted fish in front of him, that he is, in fact, a resurrected body from the dead. So there's, there's so much here in this text. I think you could clearly preach on this text and have plenty to say. However, if you wanted to, you could, I'm going to scroll up here, you could also include what in, in my teaching, especially uh, for the students back in the days when I taught homiletics, this is the premier statement by Jesus on how to preach. I always call it the kerygma, but the gospel, the proclamation. Kerig, kerig, there's going to be a G there, kerygma, the kerygma, the preaching. This is, this, is, this is where it is, and it, it is magnificently done. And these are his last words. This is his last teaching. And some of you know that there are four passion predictions, and then there are three passion statements after he rises from the dead. And this is the final passion statement, but it's, the, it's, it's a part of a constellation of seven statements that have to do with his passion and resurrection, which is amazing. Only Luke has that. Now, as you look at this, there are a couple of things that you, you want to think about when you're preaching this. First of all, there, there is this, what, what I think is a hermeneutic of, of Luke 24. And the hermeneutic goes first to the women, where they are asked to remember as he spoke to them while he was in Galilee. And then you have a passion statement that the Son of Man, it is necessary must be delivered into the hands of men, crucified, and on the third day be raised. Now here he's, he, Jesus is saying, now this is Jesus' words, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. So again, go back. Go back to the teachings of Jesus. This, remember, takes you back to Galilee and to Luke 9, that beautiful constellation of texts in 9 1 to 20, to, excuse me, 36, that concludes with the transfiguration. And here, Jesus is saying, go back to my teaching. Go back to what I said. Go back and read the whole gospel and see that everything I said is now going to be kind of repeated here in one beautiful formula. Now, to begin with, you have this, this day, this necessary, it is necessary. This is used in almost all the passion predictions and passion statements. The divine plan of God, the divine must. And there are four infinitives that are dependent on that day. To be fulfilled, to suffer, to be raised, and then to be preached. This is new. This has never been used before in any of the passion language of Luke. This is, this is the, new, the new thing, which is why I've got it here in yellow. But we have seen this language before. Um, this shows you that the preaching has to be based on the Old Testament. And what is remarkable here is that we have what we heard before at Emmaus, Moses and the prophets,
But now this is new, the Psalms. And my contention is that if you want to read in the Old Testament where you see the clearest example of the suffering righteous Messiah, you read the Psalms. And the Psalms are where you will see most clearly that the Messiah must suffering. And that, that, that he is innocent, which is of course one of the great themes of Luke's passion. He is the innocent one. The righteous is certainly suggested by that. And the fact that the thief on the cross says, truly this man was righteous, innocent, or as I like to say, just. But anyway, the Psalms, the Psalms, the Psalms are where you'll find that. And uh, there, there are some, Bonhoeffer was the first one I think that I heard this from, was that during Jesus' six hours on the cross, what he did was recite the Psalms. And you'll see Psalm 31, Psalm 69, Psalm 22. I mean, those are, the, the, in many ways, the citations we have. So the, the Psalms are where you're going to find the passion of Jesus. Then you have a little interlude there. He opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he says, thus it is written. Okay, this is the, the continuation of the fulfillment. Now, this is right out of Emmaus. This is that formulaic statement. This is the second time Jesus refers to himself as the Christ. Emmaus was the first. Be raised from the dead. You'll see that in a number of different places on the third day. But then this, this is part of the preaching. Fulfillment of scripture, suffering, death, and resurrection. But then it's got to be preached. I, I always say that, that here you have the that of the gospel. These are the objective facts. This is what happened. These are the events. But then when you get the preaching here, and let me go to a different color just to accent this. Um, when you get to the preaching here, this is the for you. This is where you, you turn to your congregation. You go, Christ suffered and rose again, and he did it for you, for the forgiveness of sins. And you can see that in the name here. That's, of course, a baptismal refer reference. This is the exact thing that John the Baptist said. Repentance, forgiveness of sins. There's the forgiveness of sins to all nations. There's the mission. You know, you, you, you have, you know, in John preaching, John the Baptist, it was, he preached a baptism of repentance into the forgiveness of sins. Now it's in his name, Jesus' name, the Trinitarian name. That's what to be, that's what to be preached. And in a sense, this, this is how the gospel is preached. You, you preach what happened in Jerusalem, and then that that is for you, and that it is present now, here, in the Viva Vox Jesu, in the preaching of Jesus. It's here now in your baptismal life. It is here now on the table, body and blood, for the forgiveness of sins. I mean, it's a most remarkable thing. And I always say there, there are the three parts of the gospel. You know, the preaching of it. There's, the, as I said, the that and the for you and the presence of that, that you have a communion with that presence that is actually preached and celebrated in the divine service. Just one final statement. In his name is, in a sense, fleshed out here where Jesus says, and behold, I, Jesus, am sending the promise, that's the Holy Spirit, and then, of course, here, of my Father. So, in Luke's Gospel, like Matthew, even though he doesn't say, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he does have baptism here in the name, and he does have the Trinity, Son, Spirit, Father. And um, th that, I think, is a remarkable thing conclusion to Jesus' words, final words, before he ascends into heaven. And then the, the command, you go sit in the city until you're clothed with power from on high, which is, of course, a reference to Pentecost. And so, in conclusion, let's, let's think about how we might preach this whole thing. First of all, um, the, the, the first part is connected to the second part in this way. 
that here you have an appearance of the risen Christ who identifies himself as the great I am, who brings the peace of the kingdom. And, and I didn't go into the peace too much, but it's a huge, you know, Lucan theme. And it, it, it certainly connects Luke 2.14 and Luke 19.38, which is incarnation and atonement. This is the entrance into Jerusalem. And of course, this is the hymn of the angels, the glory and excelsis. So here you have the identity of who Jesus is, the risen Christ. And, and, and they're disbelieving for joy because they can't believe it's too good to be true. So if you have that there, then what you have here in this second part is the content of what this risen Christ says. And, and here you could really talk about what it is in this Easter season as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is the content of our preaching? A blessed Easter to all. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.